Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Grad Coach TV, where we demystify the oftentimes perplexing world of academic research. My name is Derek, and in this video, I'm going to be speaking with one of our own coaches, David Fair. David's got a BSc, an MSc, and of course a PhD. He's been involved in tutoring and lecturing students on all things research related. And he's also been involved in supervising research projects such as dissertations and theses. So long story short, David really knows what he's talking about when it comes to research. In this video, we'll be talking about seven common mistakes that we see come up in literature reviews. We work with students day in and day out here at Grad Coach, and very often we're working with them in their literature review chapters, and we see the same mistakes over and over again. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about seven of the most common ones we see so that you can be aware of them and you can avoid these pitfalls. This discussion is based on one of the many, many blog posts over on the grad coach blog so if you are undertaking your literature review if you are undertaking a research project a dissertation or thesis be sure to check out the grad coach blog for a lot more free content just like this that's over at gradcoach.com forward slash blog also if you're looking for a helping hand with your literature review be sure to check out our private coaching services where we help you one-on-one -on -one, step by step through the literature review chapter or through your entire research project. If you'd like to learn more about that, you can book a free consultation and learn more about the service as a whole over at gradcoach.com. All right, so let's get started. David, welcome to the CoachCast. Thanks, Derek. It's great to be back. Uh, looking forward to it today. Awesome. So today we are talking about the common literature review mistakes that we see here at Grad Coach. Mm -hmm. And number one on the list is an over reliance on low quality sources, low quality literature. So, David, give us the lowdown on the low quality sources. Yeah, this is definitely something that does come up. And it's often enough also at a bit of the earlier stages in supporting clients with literature reviews. But really, if, it, if we think about it, academia can be a little bit of an elitist club. There's, there's a gold standard, there's an ideal, and we're always aiming to get to that. And so within academic literature, most of the time, specifically in your literature review, you want to be using peer reviewed resources, as that's really the gold standard. And we're talking journal articles, uh, even better than that is review articles and meta analyses. They're really the key articles that you want to be collecting. And then a step down from that would be something like an industry report, which is much more important in something like an MBA course uh, than a hard science course. Uh, you could also look at published books, particularly if they're publish published by a scientific publishing company. Uh, right. Think of Blackwell or Oxford. Uh, and also book chapters as well are a good second best. Following that, if we're looking at the sort of chain of papers and quality, we can then move into the space of, you know, theses, dissertations, uh, working on published papers, but those really aren't the ideal. And so you should be trying to limit that. Right. And then lastly, we've got blog posts, opinion pieces, you know, publications by advocacy groups or articles. That's sort of the lowest standard, if you would. Right. And that's not to say you can't use them, you just need to ensure that the meat of your review is from these gold standard sources. And that's really just ensuring that you've got good quality uh, research supporting your arguments. Right. But it's interesting even to say within that gold standard of peer reviewed articles, there's even an elitist version there. So if we think about the articles, each journal has a quality associated with it. And the mm. common one we like to use is impact factor. Yeah. Uh, so a better journal with a wider reach and more audience is going to have a higher impact factor. And this yeah. does differ between fields. I mean, cancer gets way more research than, say, uh, insects or honeybee literature. And yeah. so those things are relative. But even within a field, you can have a great journal and you can yeah. have a less great journal. And so ideally, you want to be looking at those really high impact factor journals the ones that are central to your field. 
And yeah. really, again, the benefit of the high quality resources is you're using up to date, peer reviewed, well received literature mm -hmm. as your theoretical basis, rather than something that's a little uncertain. And so really, those are some of the key points that I have in terms yeah. of that. Yeah. Cool. I think um, I think something to emphasize is that um, just to revisit how we labeled this mistake is that it's over reliance on low quality mm. sources. So it's not to say that you can't have or you can't include in your literature review, um, you know, a, a, a one of the um, lesser quality sources that you yeah. mentioned, perhaps from a an industry blog or, or um, you know, something that's not academic in nature, not peer reviewed by, by experts. It's not to say that you can't include these things, but you want to minimize it. And more than anything, you don't want to, uh, you don't want your whole argument to be sitting, uh, be laying on a foundation mm -hmm. of some lower quality um, source. So you certainly don't want your whole argument sitting on some opinion piece um, written by some blog or some YouTube or whatever the case may be. You want to build your foundation and, and um, mm -hmm. try and keep the majority of your your literature um, sort of uh, peer reviewed journals, uh, ideally higher um, impact factor journals. And and a good a good indicator, although not perfect, is if you're using uh, something like Google Scholar and you're searching for, mm -hmm. for articles. A good impact or a good indicator is just to have a look at how many citations an article has got. Yeah, it's not a perfect metric because articles can get uh, a lot of citations for the wrong reasons. You know, if everyone's referring to it in a critical way, um, but it is a, a reasonable indicator. And you can also mm -hmm. You can find out for any article that you're looking at, you can look at um, which journal it's coming from and you can go and look up what the impact factor of that is. We'll include a link below this video to, to, um, to help you find uh, the impact factor for, for various journals. So the key is just don't be over-reliant on low quality sources. Mm -hmm. You are, especially when you're researching topics that are fairly new, um, something that's just kind of coming onto the scene, naturally the literature isn't as developed, but you don't want to be, um, you don't want your whole argument to be based on, on, on the low quality sources. Um, anything else to add yeah. to that, David? I think Derek also raised a good point there in terms of specifically for very new ideas or new fields. Often enough, there is a lot more literature, um, gray literature is what we call it, um, in sort of news articles and things like that. And so a really nice way to use them is to use them as sort of emphasis points or mm. to support a theoretical view from a paper. So you might say, you know, industry 4.0 is really coming onto the scene, but maybe, you know, there's some issues with it as many news articles are pointing out that countries aren't ready, you know, for instance, South Africa's internet capacity isn't really as great as say the US. And so it's aspects like that, that you can use those lower quality papers to support that argument, but obviously you're not relying on them. You've still got that gold standard journal article that's from a peer reviewed source. All right. So that sort of links into our uh, second um, uh, literature review mistake. And that is a lack of landmark or, or also referred to as mm -hmm. seminal literature. So this is the, the key literature, the sort of um, the literature that, that broke the topic onto um, the scene. Um, this is a lack of that sort of literature in favor of, of everything else. So tell us a little bit more about this issue, David. Yeah, so this is definitely an issue when it comes to setting that real theoretical background. Um, there's often enough this feeling that you want to be citing the most recent papers really coming up to right current 2020, 2021 papers. But the counterpoint to that is you have to be showing the development of where the fields come from. And you have to also be citing the people that got things going. And so really that lack of seminal paper or landmark studies, if you're not covering that, you're actually doing a disservice to your literature review. And so an easy way to think about this is, you know, in all those 2020 and 2021 papers that you've been reading, is almost always the same author, sort of a 1998 paper or a 20 mm. or 2005 paper. And if you're seeing that same paper come through all the time, that's likely to be a landmark or seminal paper. 
Yeah. And then if you go search for that paper, I'm telling you now, its citation rate is going to be astronomical compared to yeah. the more recent ones. And so that's really a key paper that you want to be including in your lit review. Generally speaking, nearer to the start of your lit review because it's going to be the traditional section. Uh, one thing, though, to be careful when you're looking at seminal papers that have been published is do be careful of publishing group bias. Uh, and what I mean by this is there's just certain schools of researchers that like to cite each other because they're working on a similar topic. And the unfortunate side effect for that is it can become a bit of a, you know, one trick pony. And so they mm. all cite each other and they actually lose out on some of the external papers that come mm. out. Um, so do read a bit widely there um, to make sure that that seminal paper is seminal outside of the research you've been reading as well. But really, it's it's important to have this because this is the, the sort of the deep rock or the major foundation of your literature review. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's something we we've mentioned previously on uh, in in our in our previous video um, mm -hmm. is this this um, saying of you need to stand on the shoulders of of giants, and that is that is especially true uh, for the literature review. Your whole literature review is saying that the purpose of the literature review is to say, these are the giants, this is what they've said, mm -hmm. and this is how I'm going to build my research on top of this. So when we talk about um, seminal landmark literature, these are the giants, these are the big boys that started the scene and, and, and really that get um, referenced the most or cited the most. And, and again, um, I'll I'll throw Google Scholar into the mix. I'm certainly yeah. not the be all and end all of 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 uh, finding your sources, but again, if you search for, if you're doing uh, research on, let's just pick any topic. Let's say organizational trust. If that's your keyword, if that's your topic, when you put that into Google Scholar, you're very quickly going to find out um, who the, the 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 landmark researchers were, which the which uh, studies were the landmark ones, because they'll just be so heavily cited for a specific keyword. So, so yeah, that is um, that is mistake number two, and it's a big one. This is this is the kind mm -hmm. of mistake that can. Um, draw a lot of criticism from a marker or a reviewer when they're looking at your literature review. If you're not acknowledging yeah. the greats, if you're not, um, you can have the most recent research and you can have a, a pretty comprehensive literature review, an up-to-date literature review. And we'll talk about that in the next point. Um, but if you're not acknowledging the greats, you, you're, you're kind of doing a, um, a disservice to, to those who mm came before you and it's it's really frowned upon in, in academia so um even if that seminal work has been built upon uh, and developed quite substantially um that doesn't mean that it's irrelevant um, it still deserves yeah. mention and you need to include it um is there anything else to say about this mistake or is that uh, does have we covered? yeah i think um well i mean this leads into the next mistake as well but it's important to put that seminal paper into context as well so you want to be sort of looking at how things have changed from that seminal paper. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to have it in, but don't rely on that seminal paper or landmark paper to be your sort of framework for research, because we know all research frameworks develop over time uh, with yeah. more data and more experience. But it really helps, as Derek said, to stand on that shoulder of the giant and then use the new, more recent research to reach even higher. Right. Um, so really, that's what I'd say here. Um, again, this relates really strongly to the next topic as well. All right, all right. All right, so let's jump into literature review mistake number three. And this sort of goes hand in hand with uh, mistake number two. And that is to have a lack of current or, or up-to-date literature in your literature review. So previously we spoke about the the issue of sort of skipping um the seminal work skipping the 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 landmark studies the old greats um and that's clearly a problem um, but equally a problem is to not bring your literature review uh, or not to not incorporate new literature and uh, up-to-date current research into your literature review so david tell us a bit more about this common issue yeah so this is one of the uh issues that really worries me when reading a review uh, particularly if I'm looking at the review and I'm seeing that most of the papers cited or sources cited are sort of three years or older, mm -hmm. um, that gets me worried. That makes me 
has a reader or reviewer question, how up to date is this? Mm -hmm. Is there any, you know, aspects that you're missing? Has someone answered the research question that you're pursuing and you just haven't included that reference? Right. And so really this is something that you want to make sure you're getting right. Um, and ideally you should be have, having studies published within the last three to five years. This is obviously dependent on fields. Certain mm. research fields move a lot quicker than others. Right. But really, if the majority of reference of your references are five years or older, definitely consider updating your literature because yeah. that's going to lead to your reviewer or marker getting worried and being more critical. Mm. And this is something that I wanted to bring up as well in the previous section is it's including that seminal paper and including recent literature just puts you on the right foot with your marker or reviewer. Mm. It puts them on a slightly less critical path of reading. Yeah. And as a quick tip, if you are struggling with this issue of having the majority of your references being quite old, take a look at something like Google Scholar or your search engine and take a look at who has cited those papers. Mm. That's a really good way to get up to date with the recent papers. So right. for instance, if you're searching for a paper on organizational trust and you're looking at a 1999 paper, it's a seminal paper, it's really interesting. Take a look at who has cited that paper. In Google Scholar, mm -hmm. you literally click on the citation number and then you can search within that and you yeah. can filter that by time and date as well. So it's a really nice way to see how the field has developed yeah. going forward. Mm -hmm. Another aspect there is once you have those new papers, you need to contextualize them again. So we mentioned this in the previous um, topic, but you want to be comparing how things have developed or moved forward. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about reporting that paper. It's about comparing it to what's been done as well. Yeah. And then a last bit of advice on this, I would say, is it's definitely important to make sure for whatever context or topic you're working on, that you're looking into both sides or the issue or argument. Um, and this is another place where those recent literature is going to be helpful. So you want to be looking for papers that support an argument and that also don't support it. Mm -hmm. we're, we're past the days of paper wars where people used to fight and, you know, publish that Johnson et al is totally an idiot, but this <laughs> is the correct way. But we still get those issues where people are looking at differences. For example, if you're looking at performance measures for funds, you don't just want to be focusing on positive predictors. You also want to be considering some negative predictors. Mm -hmm. Also for each of those predictors, you want to see, do they perform as well in different contexts? So yeah. try and be quite wide reaching with those research. Um, similarly, you know, some people will say, we're going back to it, but industry 4.0 is the way forward for manufacturing. But mm -hmm. then other researchers say, listen, some regions just aren't ready for it. They don't have the technological capacity. And yeah. so showing both sides of that argument would be really helpful, um, yeah. particularly if it's recent arguments as well. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the, the key thing to keep in mind when you're when you're crafting your literature review is is balance and and to to provide a, a comprehensive view so it, in mistake number two and number three what we're talking about is you know being on the wrong side of balance where everything's old and seminal or everything's too new um uh, you know both of those are problematic so you want a mix of sort of old and new mm. you want to show how things have developed um and then as you say uh another component of balance is is to to make sure that your perspectives are balanced out that you're showing um uh, the pros and the cons, um, highlighting the disagreements, et cetera, um, which is bleeding into, into the fourth uh, mistake yeah. that we'll talk about. Um, but you really want to make sure that you have a, a comprehensive, uh, far-reaching literature review that doesn't get stuck in a certain time period, doesn't get stuck in a certain so, sort of um, industry lens or a, 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 mm. a certain. If if you if you're if you have any concentration of of perspective, um, then that's probably going to um, uh, run you into a bit of an issue. So something worth mentioning um, is that. For all of this, while you're while you're digging up all of your literature, it's really important that 
you're not just reading paper after paper after paper and making some um, disjointed notes. You've really got to catalog your literature. You've really mm. got to structure that uh, into something that will allow you to, once you've read your whatever, 100, 200, however many papers uh, you ultimately get through, something that you can then go back to and, and look through all your literature. And to that end, there's many ways to do that. We always encourage um, just using an Excel spreadsheet. It's a simple way and it's a free way. Um, you'll find a, a, a template catalog for that on the Grad Coach blog, which I'll link to below. Um, but you can just as easily use anything that works for you. Some people do that within their reference management software like Mendeley or, or Zotero or whatever they use. Um, but Excel is a nice way of doing it because you can then catalog your literature according to whatever criteria you want. So for example, you mm -hmm. can have a column for the date. You can have a column for um, yeah. the author or the multiple authors. You can have a column for what methodology they used. You can have a column for what industry and context their, their study was yeah. made in. So if you catalog your literature with a lot of detail, that's going to help you see quite quickly when you take a step back. It's going to help you see if perhaps you've got a real bias towards a certain time period, a certain um, methodological approach, a certain set of authors, you can see those things a lot quicker when you have all of them in, in a spreadsheet and you can sort that stuff out. So mm -hmm. um, we're digressing from the key point, but from a practical perspective, it's it's very useful and it's essential actually to to catalog all of your literature and, mm -hmm. and, and have it all in one space. Some students think, oh, I'm just gonna take some notes. I'm just gonna put this in, in Evernote or Word or whatever, and I'm just gonna have some rough notes. But uh, literature reviews, if you do them right, you're gonna be reading tons and tons of papers and yeah. there's no way you're gonna remember all those details. So the the uh, potential for bias and the potential for sort of a, a lens, a, a focus from a certain lens to creep in becomes really, um, uh, really great so you you need to have a clear catalog all right so on to mistake number four and this is i don't know about you david but this is the one that i see the most um mm -hmm. and, and it's not even a literature review thing it's an academic writing thing um and mistake number four is that students tend to focus on description rather than integration and synthesis of the literature. In other words, they end up describing the literature, providing a he said, she said, they said, they disagreed um, uh, set of descriptions about what all happened in the literature, as opposed to bringing that together and synthesizing it and relating mm -hmm. it back to their specific research objectives and research questions. So. So drill down into this one, David, because this is a beast. And I think yeah. really if there's one takeaway that that um, anyone watching this needs to, to um, put in their bag, it's that you need to focus on integration and synthesis as opposed to description. Yeah. So, I mean, you hit the nail on the head there, Derek. This is sort of one of the biggest issues. And, and realistically, it's one of the easier ones to notice from a reviewing perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as I start seeing just constantly that Johnson et al. did this, Fred did this, Susan did this, it gets really repetitive. Yeah. And so in that regard, it's cutting down on terms of how your literature review flows, but also you're really not showing any criticality. And that's always mm -hmm. what's being looked at when people are marking your research. They want to see that you as the researcher are putting things together. You're taking a look at how the different papers fit together and applying that to your research context. So really, if you find yourself simply reporting what a set of studies concluded or summarizing the papers in the field, it's time to stop. Really, you want to be putting things together. And it's a silly example, but if I mention a triangle, three squares and a rectangle, those are three shapes. You put together in context, you know, the big square, two small squares, a rectangle in the middle and a triangle on top, it's suddenly a house. So yeah. that context and putting it together is really helpful. Yeah. Uh, a more academic example would be, you know, reporting some studies about honeybee declines, about honeybee disease and RFID um, tracking technology. It's a little disjointed, right? But if you link and integrate those, um, specifically linking the crashing honeybee industry to the outbreak of something like American fowl brood and how you can use something like RFID technologies 
to track honeybees, it's telling a much more cohesive story. Right. And really what you're doing there is you as the researcher are finding how different aspects or themes or topics link to each other. Mm. Um, it's really important to do this because as Derek says, this is primarily what we're looking for when reading a literature review. We wanna see that you're building that theoretical framework and that mm. that framework is connected rather than uh, split up. Yeah. And so you should be relating your papers together. If you're reporting uh, about one paper and then a conflicting view in a second paper, mm. you need to point out that conflict and then yeah. further, you need to then synthesize what the overall view is. Yeah. You know, is there more disagreement than agreement? If there is disagreement, what type of disagreement is it? Um, it's also important to say what isn't there as well. Yeah. So for instance, when you're presenting papers, you might point out that not many studies are looking into diseases in ants. There's mm. tons of research in honeybees, but not in ants. Yeah. And so pointing out that gap is also a form of synthesis. You're yeah. saying that you've read through the papers and seen what's missing. And yeah. So that's really helpful in terms of building an integrated and synthesized literature review. Mm. And a good example to think about structurally is your literature review should be an upside down pyramid. So you're going to start broad and you're going to start with a lot of support for ideas, right? And then as you move through your topics, you're going to be coming down and getting more focused okay. until it gets to a point where there won't be support for the ideas that you're putting forward. Yeah. And that's ideally teeing up your research aims and objectives. Mm. So by having that strong synthesis, you actually also generate um, directionality towards your aims and objectives. So it's really helpful to keep this in mind because your literature review is the foundation of your study. It's just a collection of studies, it's just bricks. But if you put it together with some mortar and cement, then you have that firm foundation. That's super helpful. I think um, to, to add to what you, you're saying, um, a good question to, to always ask yourself as you're, as you're crafting your literature review is to say, am I focusing, is my, is my discussion focused on the what? In other words, what so-and-so mm -hmm. said and this person said, or is it focused on the so what? In other words, so what does that mean? How is this relevant? What's the impact of what this person said? Um, and, and to take that a step further, you really want to be saying, so what does this mean in terms of my research objectives and my research mm -hmm. questions? As, as you mentioned, David, the research questions, the research objectives, and, and the broader research aims, these things drive your entire piece of research. Yeah. They drive every chapter of your dissertation or your thesis, as we've spoken about before, and your proposal as well. Um, so yeah. everything, when you're asking yourself, you know, am I talking about the what or am I talking about the so what? And obviously, one, one leans on the other. You can't talk about the so what without first saying what uh, this mm. paper said or that paper said. You, you need to be, whenever you're writing something, you're going to start with the what. You're going to say, um, you know, uh, Johnson et al. Um, argued that X, Y, Z happened or uh, this caused that. Um, then you need to say, okay, so, so what? So what does this mean? Does it conflict with what other people have said? Why might it conflict? Um, what does this mean for my research questions? What does this mean for my research objectives? So you've got to be bringing everything back to those, those, that golden thread that we speak about so often, that golden mm -hmm. thread of research questions and objectives. You can't just be, the literature review is not a summary of the literature. It's not just a, you know, this person said, that person said, this person said. It's always the case that this person said X, Y, Z, therefore, da, 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 whatever the case may be. You've got to be pulling in that so what. And if mm -hmm. you can just use that as a very, I'm, I'm oversimplifying it here, but if you can just use that question of, what or so what, if you can use that as a, as a common tool <clears throat> while you're writing a literature review, you'll have a much, yeah. a much more um, cohesive literature review and you'll keep bringing things back to, to the research questions and the research objectives. Yeah, I think yeah. just to add to that, uh, context is key. Um, really, when you're thinking of that so what, as Derek put, so what does it mean for my case uh, mm. is really a helpful case in getting that integration across. So you might be seeing studies on 
uh, prevalence of a disease in certain racial groups or cultural groups. That's great, but what does it mean for the racial group or cultural group that I am pursuing for this study? Mm. And really putting that linkage there is super important. Uh, mm. If there isn't a linkage, maybe consider, is that necessary? And I guess that feeds into our next topic as well. Right, right. All right, so just to recap this, because this is so important and mm. such a common issue, is when you're writing your literature review remember that it's not a summary it's not simply you going for a walk down memory lane uh, recapping on what every uh, researcher has said you've got to focus on synthesis integration and linking mm. things back to your research objectives your research questions not on describing the research naturally you are going to describe but you need to keep that as brief and concise as possible mm. and focus on, okay, so what does this mean? How do we pull it together? How does this drive my, my research further? And, and it might be, might be that, you know, something you read then full forms uh, or, or um, feeds into a hypothesis that you'll go and test later. Mm. Um, exactly. It might be that something you read um, feeds into your conceptual model, your theoretical framework. Um, so uh, always focus on the, so what always focus on synthesis not just description. Cool. So on to mistake number five, uh, and and we we uh, we accidentally um, edged into it uh, with yeah. uh, our previous point, and that is mistake number five um, in terms of literature review issues is to include irrelevant or unfocused content um, to include stuff that uh, doesn't really fit into the literature review or that is mm. just isn't uh, essential to the literature review so david break this down for us yeah so this is definitely sort of opposite to our previous issue um, and i think it all points to the fact that our literature review is a continuous interactive flowing bit of literature but the important part is to make sure you stay on point. So for example, uh, going back to my previous image of the shapes, you know, you've got the square triangles and the house. If you add in a flying spaghetti monster, things get a little confusing, right? Mm -hmm. Or in the beekeeping issue, if we're start suddenly bringing up 5G radio networks and their effect on bees, that doesn't really fit in with the context of disease dynamics. And so really you've got to make sure that you are introducing literature that feeds directly into your topic aims and objectives remember in the literature review we're building a foundation for your research so you really want to be building up things and ideas and arguments that provide support for your research you don't want to be pulling things too far apart because then people are going to get lost they're going to get distracted and it's a bit difficult so I know I'm one of those people as well. When I'm reading papers, something gets exciting. You just dive down and suddenly three yeah. hours have passed and you've gone down the link um, yeah. sort of pattern and you're way out. And so a good rule of thumb I use is asking yourself, how does this relate to my core thesis message or that golden thread? Mm -hmm. And an easy way to find that golden thread is what is your aims? objectives and research questions. Mm -hmm. So you've got to ask yourself, does this relate to that aspect? And there will be times where you'll say, not exactly, but, and if you have to make too many of those justification mm -hmm. steps for including that, it's time to cut it. And yeah. that can be difficult. Uh, similarly to any form of writing, cutting content is difficult because there are babies, there are thought processes, yeah. you know, you want to keep them. but it's important to be to the point because too broad a literature view also loses impact. Yeah. So stick to that golden thread and make sure it's clear throughout the literature view, but also throughout your whole thesis and dissertation. In general, you want your aims and objectives to be key. And so right. if we want to work through an example of this, uh, let's say your aim of your research is to identify potential early detection factors associated with increased Alzheimer's risk in a particular culture group. So really we're looking at early detection factors of Alzheimer's in a group. And so we're working through the literature. We found some papers on global Alzheimer's risk factors, um, specific risk factors for different racial groups, 
Alzheimer outcomes, environmental factors, and Alzheimer prevalence. Mm -hmm. That's quite a list that I've developed there, but one of them definitely stood out as a little outside of that. And that would be the outcomes of Alzheimer's. It's yeah. important, but is it really linking to early detection? Because yeah. outcomes come way down the line. Yeah. And so that would be something to consider cutting. Another one to think about is Alzheimer prevalence. Is that necessary? If you're looking at prevalence in the cultural group or racial group, then maybe. But if we're just saying globally what presence is, that's yeah. really something you're going to put right at the start of the introduction or lit review and then not come back to. So that's yeah. also something to consider, you know, pulling back on. I think um, where this issue um, and it comes from, at least sometimes, is that while you're while you're undertaking your literature review and, and by undertaking, I mean doing your reading, not your actual writing up of the literature mm. review. While you while you're sourcing content, you're you're invariably going to find. Um, uh, and you're going to come across content that that isn't really uh, aligned with your your research objectives and your research questions, but you still got to read it in order to check whether it's aligned or not. So mm -hmm. you'll be exposed to a lot of content that's not completely relevant. And in fact, I'd say probably most of the stuff that you initially read through is is going to be not quite on point. Um, but nevertheless, while you read some of that stuff, you're going to go, "Oh, that's an interesting insight." You know, that's that's a really interesting point that 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 so and so raises there. And so you're going to go stick that into your catalog, and you're going to put it down. And then while you're writing a literature review, you you'll have these little shiny objects that you go, oh, "That was such a great point that someone that someone raised." There's such a an, an, uh, such a intellectual um, concept to bring into the discussion. So there will be these these little temptations where you something sticks in your mind a piece of literature mm. sticks in your mind because it was clever it was um, catchy it was thought-provoking um, but it wasn't necessarily directly related to your research objectives and your research questions so you've got to be careful you will you, you have to accept that you're going to spend through the literature review process through the sourcing process you're going to spend a lot of time reading and cataloging mm -hmm. cataloging stuff that that isn't really uh tightly linked to your to, to your research topic mm -hmm. um and you you need to accept that you know as i said the majority of the stuff that you read you're probably not going to use that is the purpose of the literature review process is to sift through everything that exists find what's relevant and then speak about that exclusively so you got to be as you say you got to be prepared to to just kill your babies and to let go of the stuff that's not relevant and um, when yeah. when when a, a piece of literature appeals to you because it seems really clever or it seems really thought-provoking or really wise th that's the stuff that you've got to be really careful of uh, because yeah. you, you're probably interested in it for the wrong reasons so just use um, as you as you've said David use the the research objectives the research questions use those as your guidepost uh, to to mm. to make sure that you're staying on track. If you've got, if you're sitting on the fence about should I include this point, shouldn't I include this point, go back to your research question. Say, is this relevant? Isn't this relevant? If it is really relevant, you've got to be able to really clearly justify why it is relevant. And 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 when you present that piece of content, be sure to justify mm. it as well. So yeah, so the the the, the tool, the litmus test of is this relevant? Is this uh, focused piece of content? Is look at your research aims, objectives, and mm. questions, and um, and that will tell you whether you're on track or not. Yeah, just to add to that as well. Don't be afraid of reading those papers that are slightly unrelated. Uh, one of the important parts in a literature review is making connections that mm. aren't explicit. That's where good research questions come in and gaps. So your literature review is always going to be a period where you're going to be reading a lot, mm. getting a lot of ideas. Some of them might come into your thesis, others might not, yeah. but really don't be afraid of that. But when it yeah. comes to actually writing it, then make sure you're applying that litmus test. And yeah. one thing to say is that reading period where you're reading all those different resources is truly powerful in terms of helping you to identify potential new research questions and giving you insight for your discussion chapter later on. So don't feel like you can't read that literature because it's not related to your aims, but mm. just when it comes to putting it into structure, think about how it fits.
Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. I think to sum it up in one line is you've got to you've got to read widely uh, and then write narrowly, and you've got to be focused on exactly. It. So just because um, we, we spoke about this in, in our previous video about the research proposal where we said your research has to be narrow, narrow, narrow. You've got to have um, uh, you know the, one of the, the big mistakes with research proposal is having a topic mm -hmm. that's too broad. So your topic has to be narrow, your research objectives, aims, et cetera, those need to be narrow, but your reading has got to be quite broad because you, yeah. you can't, you can't get a, a comprehensive understanding of the area. If you, if you are absolutely brutal about not reading anything from a paper that directly <laughs> links to, to what you're researching. So you've got to read wide and then write narrow. All right, so on to literature review mistake number six. And this is this one's a, a, a difficult one for, for, for me to see mm. because you can have a student that does all the right things, um, but they don't do this one. And, and the, the issue is poor structure and layout of the literature review. So a student can do wide reading, narrow writing, um, they can stay on track, they can have the seminal literature, the new literature, they can tick all the boxes that we've spoken about previously. But if your literature review isn't structured uh, well, doesn't present a, a logical and um, clear narrative, it really does degrade it substantially. So uh, David, dig into this one for us. Yeah, so as Derek rightly pointed out, this is, really one that uh, when I read reviews makes me sad to see because it's it's easily fixed or avoided if you put the right um, steps in place. But when it's not avoided, the best information can be missed because it's sandwiched between unnecessary information. Or similarly, you might have a really great idea, but because you've split it across too many paragraphs and sections, it's mm. lost. And your reviewer or marker or reader, you've got to think of them as intelligent people, but they do need a bit of a handhold as well. Mm. So ensuring that that structure is there can mm. really ensure your literature review has really good flow and that raises the quality of your research. Mm. Um, and a saying that I've heard a lot um, and it's really applicable to writing is if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And that's such a key aspect to keep in mind. So when thinking about your lit review, and this has to, I'm going to be really explicit about this, but you plan after you've read. So we said read widely, read with depth, and then plan before writing. Um, but realistically, it's very worth your while to set up a rough structure for your literature review sure. right at the start before you read in. And again, the plan isn't set in stone. Writing is a process that evolves and develops as you do it. But not having a plan means you're going to come across with a sort of unstructured, smudgy mm. kind of review. Mm. Um, so you really want to make that focus. And we have a whole video on this as well in terms of how to structure the literature review. So you can take a look at that. But broadly speaking, you want to make sure that your literature review has three main sections, there will be more subsections, but you need an introduction. And so this is where you're going to sort of outline and define your topic, as well as bring up any potential jargon or definitions that need to be made and set the scope. And this is an important one for a literature review, because we've mentioned already, you're reading widely, fields are massive, but you can't read everything. And so yeah. setting the scope says, this is what our literature review is focused on. This is what we're engaging with. And this is something we're aware of, but we won't be engaging with. And so in the introduction, you want to make that clear. Then the body of your literature review, that's the meat of what you're doing. And this needs to be carefully arranged. We've mentioned it before, but you want to be going from broad to specific, mm -hmm. but also you need to be ensuring that you're bringing out those gaps and that yeah. it's, got a structure or a flow to it. And you can do that based on themes, uh, on chronological uh, coverage of the data, or even just measures or frameworks. Just think about how you want to put it together. Mm. And lastly, you're going to have your conclusion. And the conclusion in the literature review is important. Many people feel like I've presented all the information, 
we'll go, dive straight into the methodology. But here is where you really tie it all together. Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of the ending piece that most people will read most heavily. Mm -hmm. And here you want to pull up some key points from the lit review and key gaps and set the scene for your aims, objectives, and the research that's going to follow. So really think about the conclusion as an important aspect for pulling together that lit review overall. And really in all these cases, definitely from my experience, making a plan at the start is great. And you can do that in Word, you can do that on paper, you can just do headings and topics, but having that is super important. Yeah. Uh, one other thing to think about is there's also ways that you can structure your writing itself to improve flow and structure. So if you have find yourself constantly going back and making changes and putting things back in, this might be an issue that you're struggling with. So having that plan will help you weave in those papers easier. Mm -hmm. um, but also there's a point where too much planning is stopping writing. So there's always a bit of a, a factor to keep in mind. So make a plan, don't feel you have to stick to it, but also don't just plan forever because yeah. I'm a procrastinator. I know that's how it works. Um, and lastly, just an extra tip in terms of structuring your lit review, make sure you're signposting things quite clearly. Um, so it really helps to have good transitions between sections and paragraphs uh, and to make those linkages clear. This is another form of that synthesis we were talking about where you're relating one topic or section to another one. Yeah. And one of the ways to do this is to just use the standard paragraph structure. You have a topic sentence that introduces what idea is being covered in the paragraph. Mm -hmm. You have the body sentences, that's the support, that's where your references are gonna come in and then a leading sentence that transitions from the current paragraph to the next topic sentence of the next paragraph. And that's really helpful for getting a good flow between your paragraphs, but you can apply the same thing to your sections as well. So you can have a topic paragraph that introduces the idea, body paragraphs that are the specifics, and then a leading paragraph that helps you transition from the current section into the next. And all these things are pretty straightforward to do, but if you don't account for them, things feel muddy and lack flow. And when it lacks flow, readers get tired, they're not paying attention as well, and it's an easy way to lose marks. Yeah, so, so just to recap on that, I think the key takeaways are that one, you, you need to, when you, when you start writing your literature review, or before you start writing your literature review, you need to have some sort of outline. This doesn't need to be mm -hmm. ultra detailed, um, but you need to have some some bullet point list where you you map it out yeah. and you say, okay, well, first I'm going to introduce this, then I'm going to talk about that, then I'm going to talk about that, then I'm going to talk about that, then I'm going to bring these things together, etc. You've got to understand what are the sort of broad movements, what is the narrative, what is the story that you're you're trying to tell. You've got to know what that story mm -hmm. is, and you've got to. Um, plot it out in bullet point form before you start writing. Otherwise, you're going to just waffle. You're just going to talk yeah. and talk and talk and talk and talk. And and as you say, David, your reader's just going to get tired. Um, and then in terms of of the overarching structure, um, I think the you mentioned the sort of the intro, the body, and the conclusion to the literature review. I think the the old the old saying about effective communication of um, tell them what you're going to tell mm -hmm. them tell them and yeah. then tell them what you told them. Uh, I think that's really something to keep in mind, yeah, is that you you need to be reinforcing those things mm -hmm. at, at all levels. And then within the actual body, the part where you tell them, uh, when you actually feature the literature review, you have some choices there in terms of how you mm -hmm. structure that. Most commonly, um, your literature review will be structured by way of themes. So you might do things mm. for antecedent if you're doing that kind of research, um, but it could be any kind of um, um, theme or group uh, that you could discuss things. You could discuss things chronologically, in other words, how the theory has developed over time, um, or you could discuss things per methodology. So if, you're, if you've got a really mm. tight, narrow focus and you want to look at 
what the literature has said based on the different methodologies that were um, used. So that can be a useful way of, of understanding sort of um, the key the key findings mm -hmm. from a qualitative perspective versus the key findings from a quantitative perspective. So yeah, yeah um, all of this stuff we do touch on uh, on a post uh, on the Grad Coach blog. Um, so I'll include a link to that below. But the key thing is um, plan it out uh, and then start writing. And of course, as you write, writing is a form of thinking. As you write, things are going to mm. evolve. Your your outline is going to change. Your your um your total structure will will develop a bit. But you've got to have something to start with. Otherwise, you will end up waffling. And literature review chapters is generally one of the biggest ones. Uh, so you really yeah. don't want that major portion of word count to be um, flip flopping all over the place because you'll just lose your reader and they'll get bored and confused. That's not a good foundation for marks. <laughs> One thing to add as well is having that rough plan is also really helpful in getting you going with the writing process. Mm -hmm. I know lots of people get really stuck up on, I have so much information in my head and in my catalog that I don't know how to get it on the page. That planning section is really helpful for that. And it's also helpful in another format. So obviously in an ideal world, we just write from beginning to end of the literature review and be done with it. But unfortunately, writer's block is a thing, you know, motivation's a thing, and factors like that are problematic. And so if you find yourself getting stuck in one section of your lit review, if you've got a structure in mind, you can jump and start working on another section. And often enough, that's an easy way to build that momentum you need to keep writing. And so think about it in that way as well. It's not just something to stick to, but it's also a tool to use in helping you make progress going forward. Right. And the last bit of advice I'd give is just make things smaller. If it feels too big a task, make it more focused. So in that structure, and again, this isn't for everyone, you can take that structure as detailed as you want, and that can make really easy small sections that you can tick off on your checklist to give you the momentum to hit the bigger tasks. All right, so let's jump on to the seventh and final mistake that we see uh, with regards to literature reviews. And this one, this one grinds me um, endlessly because it's such a, it's such an easy thing to get right. Um, mm. And, and not getting it right really costs students a lot of marks. And that is mistake number seven is that we see um, poor referencing, poor uh, use of citations and references, and as a consequence of that, um, just outright plagiarism. So David, take us through this issue. Just don't do it. That's all <laughs> I can say about plagiarism. I've seen too many students have had their academic journey cut short because, mm -hmm. you know, in some cases, it's a, a dock of marks taken off your um, final result, but in other cases, the outcomes of plagiarism are much more dire. So really try not to do this as much as possible. Mm. And that's a scary thing. Everyone always tells you don't plagiarize, but really how do we make sure we don't plagiarize? And the important thing is when citing your work, make sure it's in your own words. Mm. And this is hard to do when the original piece said it so perfectly, you know, mm -hmm. the way they put it, they made sure there was no extra words, they got the point across perfectly, can't I just, you know, fit it in? Unfortunately not. Um, you need to reword it. And sometimes that's important because in rewording it, you can come up with new ideas and new mm. thinking. But if there's absolutely no way around rewording a sentence, there is a way you can use a direct quote, but I want to expressly say, use this sparingly. Yeah. Too many times you see reviews that are just quotation after quotation after quotation. Mm. And that becomes really difficult for me as a reader. Um, I will start questioning, where is your voice in mm. this paper? So think about quotes as emphasis, not for ways to skirt plagiarism or to get around things. Mm -hmm. So you should have very few direct quotes. In the ideal world, you will be taking that work, repurposing it, seeing how it links and putting it in a new way in your own words. Yeah. And generally speaking, if we go back to our previous 
comment on the topic of synthesis versus reporting. This is one of the techniques you can use to really help avoid plagiarism. Mm -hmm. If instead of just being reporting what studies have found, you're instead identifying the relationships that exist yeah. between studies, that's going to help you avoid plagiarism because you're not directly citing the, what they've said, you're putting it into new context. And yeah. so that's a really nice way to avoid plagiarism. Um, so to put that in simple words, look at the relationships rather than the facts. Mm -hmm. And that's what you should be aiming for when citing work. Yeah. Another thing is there are tools out there. Um, there are ways to check for plagiarism and the institutions are using them. You can as well. It's yeah. not to say that you should aim to see how much plagiarism you can get in. I'm not saying that at all, mm -hmm. but it's important to know there's some times where you might just have done it accidentally. And so having those checks before submitting is absolutely so helpful and kind of related as Derek has mentioned is related to plagiarism is often enough poor referencing as well. Um, often enough that can be as simple as just formatting it incorrectly. Mm. And that's, Fortunately, we live in an era where we have things like reference managers. I personally love Mendeley, but you know, there's Sartre, RefWorks, there's a range of them. So definitely make use of those. They really help your life out. But as a word of warning, keep the PC, com um, keep that idea in mind of Geiger, which is garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. So when you're referencing papers, make sure we put them into your reference manager correctly, yeah. uh, that you've got the right author, the right dates, etc. One of the nice things is most recent ref managers will actually allow you to search by a DOI score, mm -hmm. um, which is just a series of numbers, and that will automatically update it for you correctly. Yeah. Uh, so definitely make sure that's correct. But also related to citing incorrectly is not citing enough uh, that's something that we see a lot as well, presenting yeah. ideas that should be cited mm. as your own. And if it isn't your idea, rule of thumb is cite it or don't yeah. include it. Um, if you're unsure if it's your original idea, go out and look, see if anyone has said it before. Google yeah. Scholar is a great search engine for that, but you can also take a look at the databases that you're using for your search engine but really make sure you're citing as much as possible. I don't think they ever say this paper has too many citations. That's never right. really an issue. Right. Uh, rather have more citations than less. Right, right. Cool. Yeah, just, just to add to that um, and to emphasize your last point, David, is that you, you definitely need to err on the side of citing more rather than less. Mm -hmm. um, as, as a general rule of thumb is that if you're making some point in, in, in your paper, that's not common knowledge. That's not just uh, something that everyone knows. Um, generally, you need to cite that because it means it's someone else's idea, someone else's work that, um, that needs to be cited. And, and that is students, when they think of plagiarism, they think it means, okay, well, I copy pasted out of a journal article or a textbook and I didn't cite it, I didn't put it in quotes, but it's, it's the same thing when you're just presenting an idea in your own words, um, but it's someone else's idea. It's someone else's mm. piece of research that you've read. If you don't cite them, it's essentially plagiarism. So yeah. you need to cite more often than not. And, um, and then just to touch on the point of, of reference management software again, um, citing, putting in your citations, putting in your parentheses, author date, whatever, that, that's not something you need to do manually. And it's definitely not something yeah. you should be doing manually because you're in a dissertation with hundreds of, of, of citations, you're going to mess it up. It's just a, it's way too technical to get it right hundreds of times over and over again. So make sure that you're using some piece of, of reference management software. There's great free ones. Um, we've got, mm on the Grad Coach YouTube channel, we've got a how-to guide for, for Mendeley and for Zotero. Those are two completely free pieces of software. Check those out. Uh, if you don't like them, check something else out. Uh, if you're totally stuck, use the, the referencing tool in Word. It's not great, but it's better than you doing it manually. Um, but use some sort of software and, and, and make sure that you're putting the right information 
in. Uh, if you're mm -hmm. if you're loading in the wrong piece of information, if there's spelling errors or something, um, the reference mm -hmm. management software is not magically going to fix that. So you've got to make sure that you put that data in. And my suggestion is always to, while you're doing your initial sourcing of literature, when mm -hmm. as you read each journal article, just slap it into the reference management software. Yeah. You might use it, you might not. Chances are you won't. But if you do, it's already there and you don't need to then go and load that stuff in manually afterwards. So while you're building your literature catalog, just as a, an extra step, just put that reference into uh, your reference manager and then things will be uh, easily taken care of. You, you'll write your, your piece of copy and you'll just use the reference management software to say, okay, insert the citation. It will add it in the document and it will add it to your reference list and it will be perfect provided you set it up correctly. So so there's really no reason uh, to, to, to lose marks uh, with plagiarism mm. and referencing. And, and as you said, David, losing marks is the best case scenario. Some institutions yeah. will just say plagiarism, you're out, you failed, or whatever yeah. the case may be. Um, and that that's that's really a tragedy because you could put mm. all the all, you could do all the right things. You can take all the other boxes we've spoken about, um, but then you go down for plagiarism. It's just really not worth it. So yeah, so yeah uh, make sure that you don't plagiarize. Make use of reference management software, and uh, you'll stay on top. Yeah, just to add, we're at the end of the list here, but I think Derek's mentioned it and I've mentioned it as well, but putting a little bit of thought into your literature review in terms of building a catalog, um, building your reference management um, pool of resources, doing the work at the start is going to help you in the long run at the end. It's really hard to go back and fix all those little issues as they come in rather put the effort in when you're reading the literature to catalog well to uh, add it to your reference manager correctly so that going forward your writing process is as smooth as can be because the writing process is where you really want to be driving and developing your ideas not worrying about is the comma in the right place do i have a reference for this so definitely i would say focus on those and the planning really helps make your lit review as strong as it can be. All right, so that pretty much wraps up our seven literature review mistakes. Of course, these aren't the only mistakes you can make. Sadly, okay. there are many, many more, and uh, I'm sure we'll be circling back and doing another seven literature review mistakes video <laughs> at some point in the future. Yeah. Um, but those are seven common ones that you really need to look out for. And uh, and if you avoid those, you'll be avoiding the most common pitfalls. So, mm. David, thanks again for your time. It's been great having you here again. Thanks for sharing your uh, endless knowledge with our viewers. And, uh, and yeah, um, thanks for your time. All right, so that pretty much wraps up this episode of Grad Coach TV. Remember, if you're interested in learning more about literature reviews, about the research process in general, be sure to check out the Grad Coach blog over at gradcoach.com forward slash blog, where you can find loads of free information on literature reviews, proposals, methodologies, pretty much everything research related. Also, if you are looking for a helping hand with your research, whether that's a dissertation or thesis or any other kind of research project, be sure to check out our private coaching services where we hold your hand step by step through the research process. You can learn more about that and book a free consultation with one of our friendly coaches over at gradcoach.com. So that's all for today. Until next time, good luck.